are you? And how the mischief did you get here? And where the thunder did you come from? I'm only a private personage, an unassuming stranger, lately arrived from America. No, not a missionary, not a whaler, not a member of His Majesty's government, not even Secretary of the Navy. Ah, heaven, it is too blissful to be true. Alas, I do but dream. And yet that noble, honest countenance, those oblique, ingenious eyes, that massive head, incapable of, of anything, your hand, give me your hand, bright waif. Excuse these tears. For sixteen weary years I have yearned for a moment like this, and here his feelings were too much for him, and he swooned away. I pitied this poor creature from the bottom of my heart, I was deeply moved. I shed a few tears on him and kissed him for his mother. I then took what small change he had and shoved. Chapter 67 The Legislature of the Island What its president has seen Praying for an enemy Woman's rights Romantic fashions Worship of the shark Desire for dress, full dress, not Paris style. Playing, playing empire, officials and foreign ambassadors, overwhelming magnificence. I still quote from my journal. I found the national legislature to consist of half a dozen white men and some 30 or 40 natives. It was a dark assemblage. The nobles and ministers, about a dozen of them altogether, occupied the extreme left of the hall, with David Kalakua, the king's chamberlain, and Prince William at the head. The president of the assembly, His Royal Highness M. Kakanaoa, since dead, and the vice president, the latter a white man, sat in the pulpit, if I may so term it. The president is the king's father. He is an erect, strongly built, massive-featured, white-haired, twiny old gentleman of 80 years of age or thereabouts. He was simply but well-dressed in a blue cloth coat and white vest and white pantaloons without spot, dust, or blemish upon them. He bears himself with a calm, stately dignity and is a man of noble presence. He was a young man and a distinguished warrior under that terrific fighter Kamohomea the first, more than half a century ago. A knowledge of his career suggested some such thought as this. This man, naked as the day he was born, and war club and spear in hand, has charged at the head of a horde of savages against other hordes of savages more than a generation and a half ago, and reveled in slaughter and carnage, has worshipped wooden images on his devout knees, has seen hundreds of his race offered up in heathen temples as sacrifices to wooden idols at a time when no missionary's foot had ever pressed this soil, and he had never heard of the white man's God, has believed his enemy could s secretly pray him to death, has seen the day in his childhood when it was a crime punishable by death for a man to eat with his wife, or for a, a plebeian to let his shadow fall upon the king. And now look at him, an educated Christian, neatly and handsomely dressed, a high-minded, elegant gentleman, a traveler in some degree, and one who has been the honored guest of royalty in Europe, a man practiced in holding the reins of an enlightened government, and well-versed in the politics of his country, and in general practical information. Look at him sitting there presiding over the deliberations of a legislative body, among whom are white men, a grave, dignified, statesmanlike personage, and is seemingly natural and fitted to the place as if he had been born in it, and had never been out of it in his lifetime. How the experiences of this old man's eventful life shame the cheap inventions of romance. Kekuanaoa is not of the royal blood. He derives his princely rank from his wife, who was a daughter of Kamehameha the Great, 
Under other monarchies, the male line takes precedence of the female in tracing genealogies, but here the opposite is the case. The female line takes precedence. Their reason for this is exceedingly sensible, and I recommend it to the arist aristocracy of Europe. They say it is easy to know who a man's mother was, but etc., etc. <laughs> Christianizing of the natives has hardly even weakened some of their barbarian superstitions, much less destroyed them. I have just referred to one of these. It is still a popular belief that if your enemy can get hold of any article belonging to you, he can get down on his knees over it and pray you to death. Therefore, many a native gives up and dies, merely because he imagines that some enemy is putting him through a course of damaging prayer. This praying an individual to death seems absurd enough at a first glance. But then when we call to mind some of the pulpit efforts of certain of our own ministers, the thing looks plausible. In former times, among the islanders, not only a plurality of wives was customary, but a plurality of husbands likewise. Some native women of noble rank had as many as six husbands. A woman thus supplied did not reside with all her husbands at once, but lived several months with each in turn. An understood sign hung at her door during these months. When the sign was taken down, it meant next. <laughs> In those days, women were rigidly taught to know her place. Her place was to do all the work, take all the cuffs, provide all the food, and content herself with what was left after her lord had finished his dinner. She was not only forbidden by ancient law and under penalty of death to eat with her husband or enter a canoe, but was debarred under the same penalty from eating bananas, pineapples, oranges, and other choice fruits in any time or at any place. She had to confine herself pretty strictly to poi and hard work. These poor ignorant heathens seem to have had a sort of groping idea of what came of woman eating fruit in the Garden of Eden. <laughs> and they did not choose to take any more chances. But the missionaries broke up this sa satisfactory arrangement of things. They liberated woman and made her e the equal of man. The natives had a romantic fashion of burying some of their children alive when the family became larger than necessary. The missionaries interfered in this matter too and stopped it. To this day the natives are able to lie down and die whenever they want to whether there is anything the matter with them or not. If a Kanaka takes a notion to die, that is the end of him. Nobody can persuade him to hold on. All the doctors in the world could not save him. A luxury which they enjoy more than anything else is a large funeral. If a person wants to get rid of a troublesome native, it is only necessary to promise him a fine funeral and name the hour and he will be on hand to the minute. At least his remains will. All the natives are Christians now, but many of them still desert to the great shark god for temporary succor in time of trouble. An eruption of the great volcano of Kilauea, or an earthquake, always brings a deal of latent loyalty to the great shark god to the surface. It is common report that the king, educated, cultivated, and refined Christian gentleman, as he undoubtedly is, still turns to the idols of his fathers for help when disaster threatens. A planter caught a shark and one of his Christianized natives testified his emancipation from the thrall of ancient superstition by assisting to dissect the shark after a fashion forbidden by his abandoned creed. But remorse shortly began to torture him. He grew moody and sought solitude, brooded over his sin, refused food, and finally said he must die and ought to die, for he had sinned against the great shark god and could never know peace any more. He was proof against persuasion and ridicule, and in the course of a day or two took to his bed and, and died, although he showed no symptom of disease. His young daughter followed his lead and suffered a like fate within the week. Superstition is ingrained in the native blood and bone, and it is only natural that it should crop out in time of distress. Wherever one goes in the islands, he will find small piles of stones by the wayside, covered with leafy offerings placed there by the natives to appease evil spirits 
or honor local deities belonging to the mythology of former days. In the rural districts of any of the islands, the traveler hourly comes upon parties of dusky maidens bathing in the streams or in the sea without any clothing on and exhibiting no very intemperate zeal in the matter of hiding their nakedness. When the missionaries first took up their residence in Honolulu, the native women would pay their families frequent friendly visits day by day, not even clothed with, with a blush. It was found a hard matter to convince them that this was rather indelicate. Finally, the missionaries provided them with long, loose calico robes, and that ended the difficulty. For the women would troop through the town stark naked, with their robes folded under their arms, march to the missionary houses, and then proceed to dress.